All right, so, so this fall we've been talking about vital signs of our spiritual and personal health, and, it's, and what I've been trying to communicate is that I think that, that the vital sign is finding balance between various competing goods and various competing values that we struggle with or that we're presented with in life and in this world. And today, I want to talk about finding a balance between humility and discernment. The, a balance between the importance of us not being judgmental and the importance of us sometimes making a right judgment. The passage is one that might be familiar to some of you. It comes from the Sermon on the Mount, and it's one of the words of Jesus. And it's uh, Matthew chapter 7. You can find it in your program. It's right smack in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you'll be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. And don't give the dogs what is sacred. Don't throw your pearls to swine. If you do, they might trample them under their feet and then turn to tear you to pieces. This is God's word for God's children this morning. Now, I think if you talk to the man on the street and you ask him why they hate church so much, There's usually two reasons they say, two reasons that they give. One is that people are judgmental, and the other is that they're hypocritical. I mean, it's like you can can handle imperfect people so long as they're not judgmental, or maybe you could handle a judgmental person if they were actually perfect and had a leg to stand on, but the observation of most people in most churches most of the time is that churches are judgmental while having as many issues as everybody else around, around them. And this is one of the biggest reasons people stay away from the church, one of the biggest reasons people are turned off by the church, one of the biggest reasons churches blow up over time. And especially as I've, as I've talked to people in Jersey City who have a long history in church, so many of them have a negative experience of seeing judgmentalism in the church or, or seeing just rank hypocrisy in the church. But the good news is that Jesus knew this was going to be a problem for his followers, and so he warned them about it. He knew this was going to be an issue for the kinds of people who started to follow him as they made it on their journey. This was going to be part of the transition that we'd have to work through. And so, and so he showed them a path and showed them an alternative way of looking at things. And now, as I talk about this today, I don't pretend to be part of the solution but hopefully we can look at what Jesus says and try to understand how the gospel of Jesus Christ relates to us and see the path to the solution from him. The first thing I want you to see here is that Jesus says that humility has to always trump judgment. He says, do not judge or you too will be judged. And in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. See, the problem with judging is if you're not perfect, it's going to come around and and smack you in the face because the very judgment you use on other people is going to be applied to yourself. And, you know, here's the thing. This is the irony of human nature. And maybe you've seen this. Maybe if, if you're honest, you've probably seen this in yourself. It's that we judge other people to make us ourselves feel better about ourselves. Have you ever done that? You, you're kind of fully aware of your own flaws or your own issues, but you think to yourself, well, at least I'm not Adam. And, <laughs> and when, when you think that, you, you suddenly feel better. I mean, I, I don't know why, why it works like that, but, but there's, there's, there's this reflex in us that when we can find someone else who we can condemn, it instantly kind of elevates us. And that's what a lot of church people do, right? We, we look down on other people. We find other people who, who are more of a mess than us, and it, and it just uh, reassures us and makes us feel better about our own issues. You know, I'm not perfect, but at least I'm better than this person. I'm not, 
I'm not flawless, but at least I, I don't have the issues that that person has. But here's the paradox of this, and here's the irony of human nature, and maybe you've noticed this too, is the place where you're most vehement about judging other people, that's the place where you have issues. Did you know that? Have you noticed this? Maybe you've noticed this in Fritz, that whatever, whatever, whatever you tend to be most judgmental about with other people is the very thing that you're going to probably be the thing that you're struggling with the most. And you know, I, I first realized this, actually, a, a person pointed this out to me. He said, you, know, you want to see what someone else is struggling with? Listen to them and listen to what they're judging other people for. And that will show you what they're really struggling with. That, that will show you what they're really practicing. And, but it's not just a, a psychological insight. It's actually something that Paul the, the Apostle said when he was explaining the gospel in the book of Romans. Look at Romans chapter 2. I think you can got it on the screen there. He says, when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? You preach against stealing, but do you steal? You say that people should not commit adultery. Do you commit adultery? And what he's, what he's saying there, what Paul is saying there is, is one of the ways we justify ourselves is by condemning other people. One of the ways we make ourselves, we vindicate ourselves is by finding other people who are worse than us. It's one of the worst human reflexes. So the gravity of hypocrisy is we judge others for doing the very things that we are doing because our impulse of self-justification is so strong that even if we have to condemn other people to, to validate ourselves, we'll go ahead and do that. See, one of our strongest reflexes is to say, you know, it's not my fault, but if I can punish you for something you've done, then I'll feel better about myself. I mean, have you experienced this in your interactions? Maybe something bad happens at work and you're like, well, someone's gonna take the blame for this and then you find out, oh, so-and-so got fired, and so, so that, that's good. So, so the, the sacrificial lamb has been sacrificed, and the rest of us can kind of get, get along with things. Or, or when you're, remember when you were living at home, and you had maybe a little brother, and something breaks? And you say, well, Joey did it. And so long as Joey gets the blame for it, it means that nobody else is going to get in trouble. You know, Because so long as someone else is getting punished, so long as someone else is suffering for for the sin, then, then it means I'm going to be OK. And so one of the ways we try to justify ourselves and validate ourselves is by being condemning to other people. The, one of the, the worst places we see this is when whole communities turn on other communities in close proximity. You know, Famously, back in the 40s, Adolf Hitler blamed the, the Jews in Germany for all the problems in Germany, and, and that precipitated the Holocaust. But that pattern of what Hitler did in the 30s and 40s is actually something that keeps repeating itself all over the world when you find one group and you pit that group against another group, and that's the way that, that the different groups can elevate themselves or feel better about themselves by blaming their problems or blaming their issues or condemning or, or, or turning against another group. So that creates this toxic brew of blame and recrimination, and it makes everybody miserable. It ruins families, it ruins churches, it ruins communities, it ruins whole countries if we let it get out of hand. The irony is, you know what the Christian message is? You know what the Christian gospel is? It's that we're not justified by condemning other people or by blaming other people, the way you and I are justified is by trusting in the suffering of Christ, trusting that Jesus was punished for our transgressions, that Jesus suffered in our place, and in him and through him, we can be made just. In Isaiah 53, it puts it this way. He says, he, that is Jesus, was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was laid on him. He goes on to say, all we like sheep have gone astray. All of us turned to our own way, but God laid on him the iniquity of us all. See, we have the strong impulse, all of us do, to justify ourselves by condemning other people, but the gospel says, no, you're justified because Jesus was 
condemned. You're justified because he suffered in your place. Your, your punishment has been taken away because he bore that punishment. The price has been paid by him, and because of him you can go free. And so when we're struggling with our own sin, when we're struggling with the sin of those around us, we've got to look to Jesus. That's what the gospel tells us to do. That's what the gospel offers us in the midst of looking at a world full of broken people and looking at our own brokenness, to realize that the justification of Jesus is the justification we need. And, and it's only by looking at him and trusting in his suffering in our place that we can be elevated to the place that we're desperately trying to go. The gospel is not that we justify ourselves by condemning others, but we're justified by Jesus alone. And so Paul has a stark, or excuse me, Jesus has a stark warning here. He says, do not judge or you will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So what he's saying is, it's a bad sign when you reflexively judge other people. It's a bad sign when you reflexively condemn other people or want to put the blame on other people. Because you know what it shows? It shows you haven't yet understood the grace of God in Christ. You haven't yet understood what it means that Jesus died for you, that the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. So when you and I were tempted all the time to judge other people, to condemn other people, to punish other people for our issues, look to Jesus and remember what you're really looking for, what you're really longing for is the justification that was only available, that is only available through Christ and through him alone. So humility has to trump our judgment and humility that, that trusts in Christ alone is the hope for all of us. And the second thing I want you to see here is that humility is actually what saves us from hypocrisy. In this passage, Jesus uses a little bit of sort of a slapstick comedy. He says, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? Why do you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your own eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye and then you'll see clearly, then you'll see clearly to take, remove the speck from your brother's eye. See how that works? <laughs> But he's talking there about how, how ridiculous we all look when we're blind to our own issues. You know, it's just, and, and we all know people like that. We've all been people like that who, who are pointing out the issues of others, but, but we are blind to our own issues. We're mocking others or we're, we're condemning others for the, the problems they have, but we're not aware of the problems that we have. Because you know who the hardest person for you to see clearly is in this world? The hardest person for you to, to really have insight into in this world? It's yourself. I mean, think about this. Have you ever been sitting at an intimate uh, dinner for two, and uh, all of a sudden, the person across from you gets a little bit of sauce on their chin, and it's just kind of hanging there, just, just dripping there? And they got no idea. They, they think they're impressing you. They think they're wowing you with their insights and entertaining you. <laughs> With, with their stories, but, but all this time there's they're just this uh, little red sauce just hanging, hanging there off their chin. And you're like, this person just looks ridiculous and pathetic right now, and they've got no idea. But that's the story of all of us sometimes, right? Because the hardest person for us to see clearly is ourselves. The hardest person for us to understand is ourselves. And, uh, you know, I mean, I, I know a lot of you, you think your roommate is difficult to live with, but have you tried living with yourself? I mean, that can be really difficult. You think your coworker is hard to work with, but have you tried working with yourself? That can be almost impossible sometimes. You know, someone pointed out to me recently that the common denominator in all your dysfunctional relationships is you. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that, that's kind of a hard thing to uh, come to grips with. But it goes to the basic Christian doctrine, the Christian doctrine that all of us are sinners. In other words, all of us are deeply flawed. In other words, all of us are self-deceived. We can't even see ourselves clearly. You know, the essence of sin is self-deception, that we, we fail to clearly see who we are and what we are and what our 
real issues and problems are. You know, we take this as an abstraction, an abstraction sometimes, you know, sin is an abstract thought, but really what it is, is our tendency to pride and our tendency to ignore our own issues and point out the issues of everybody around us. You know, the, uh, because if we actually saw our sin, we'd, we'd have something of a breakdown, we couldn't, wouldn't be able to handle it. And so the hypocrisy of churches that everybody hates and everybody's frustrated with is not necessarily that, that people in church call out sin. I think you would almost expect people to do that. But it's that people look at the church and say, look at all the mess that's in there, all these people who think that they're better than us when we know for a fact that they're actually just like us. And especially, you know, in my conversations with people, a lot of people who, who are longtime residents of Jersey City who had experience with a lot of churches, so many people have given up because they've seen so much hypocrisy, because they've seen so many times where there was, was judgmentalism that wasn't backed up by people who had a clear-eyed view of themselves and their own shortcomings and their own failures. The church's message is never moral superiority. It's never moral reformation, like get your life together, follow the rules, and everything will work out. The church's message is always God is gracious, God is merciful, and salvation is available to anyone who can admit their moral bankruptcy and ask Jesus for a, a bailout. Salvation is available to anyone who can admit their moral failure and ask Jesus for help. Anyone who can admit that they can't do it and ask Jesus to give them the grace to do it. That's the essence of the Christian gospel. It's for sinners who are willing to accept the gift of God's grace. See, the church has nothing to offer to accomplishes nothing by condemning others, but what we can offer them is a grace that is greater than all our sin. And if we will just uh, offer that, then we'll attract and not repel. So there's this humility that's built into the gospel because the gospel is for sinners. The gospel is starts with us admitting that we're not perfect, admitting that we've got logs in our own eye that we don't even know about, and that's why we keep walking into walls and, and bumping into people, because we're not even aware of all of our issues. The gospel is only available for those who recognize their moral bankruptcy and their failure and are willing to rest in Jesus. You know, the hardest thing about becoming a Christian is admitting that you need help, admitting that you can't save yourself and that you need help. Uh, savior. And uh, that's a message that can't be delivered by people who think they're morally superior, superior but, it's, but for those who accept it, it's a grace that can be offered to everybody around us. But having said all this, the reality in this world is that we do need to learn how to practice discernment. We need to learn how to how to discern right from wrong and good from bad to survive in this world. And, and this passage actually says there's a possibility of that. Look at verse 5 again. It says, first take the log out of your own eye, then you'll see clearly to remove, to remove the speck from your brother's eye. You know, the problem is not that we're discerning, but that we offer a hypocritical discernment, that we're discerning about others, but we're blind to our own issues. That's what he's warning us against. And he says, you know, if you do the work on yourself, if you do the work of, of uh, self-examination, if you do the work of accountability and of working with other people to become the person that you're supposed to be, then you'll arrive at a place where you actually can help others. But the point of seeing clearly is not so that you can go around now finally from a position of moral superiority pointing down at people. But the point of seeing clearly is getting to a place where you're actually able to help other people. I mean, I think most of us have had the experience of having something caught in our eye. Any of you had something in your eye ever? It's, it's not a comfortable experience. And so sometimes when that happens, what, what you definitely need is you need to find somebody who you can trust to help you get that thing out of your eye, right? 
And so, so it is necessary, it is even essential that we get to a place where we can help people get things out of their eye, where we, where we can see clearly to help those in need. Not so that we can judge, but so that we can help, so that we can assist, and so that we can build up. Not out of superiority, but out of mercy, out of grace, out of generosity. So I think really there's two extremes that you have to avoid. One is to be so judgmental that you turn people off, that you're that person walking around with a log in your eye. And when you're judgmental like that, as Jesus says, you're setting yourself up for judgment. You're showing that you don't really understand what it means to be justified by Christ alone through grace alone. But then there's also a need for discernment. And Jesus describes this in stark language in verse 6. Look at verse 6. This is important. On one hand, he says, do not judge. Then he says, but don't give to dogs what is sacred, and don't throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and then turn and tear you to pieces. So on one hand, he says, don't judge. On the other hand, he says, you better recognize the dogs and pigs and treat them accordingly. So he says, we need to operate with humility and with discernment at the same time. Some people are dangerous. Some people are destructive. Some people, no matter how much you give them, they're going to trample it under their feet. And some people, no matter how many times you make, you make yourself available to them, make yourself vulnerable to them, they're just going to take advantage of that to, and tear you apart. Uh, you know, and this, this is hard because this happens. This doesn't happen in our casual, you know, there, there's certain people you see on the street, you give them a wide berth because you're like, that person might, looks like they might be dangerous. But where this actually happens, where we find ourselves entangled with the dogs and pigs of, of this world, is usually in our closest relationships and our most complicated relationships with, uh, with a child, with a parent, with a spouse, with a coworker, with a sibling, with a close friend. And we realize this is somebody who I'm committed to, somebody I'm entangled in, in a relationship with, someone who I depend on or someone who depends on me, but I just can't trust them anymore. I just can't, I, I just can't uh, give them anymore. I just have to let them go. I need, you know, every time I, uh, I try to help them, it always turns out bad. I try to, try to help them sacrificially, but they trample my help under their feet. I offer myself to them one more time. I, I let things go one more time. And as a result, I just get torn to pieces. And so the question is, what do you do here? And Jesus gives us really clear instructions. Do not give. Let them go. Stop making yourself vulnerable to being torn to pieces. Stop giving to someone who's just going to trample it under your feet. Stop giving people what they can't appreciate. Stop giving people something that does them no good because they keep wasting it. Stop allowing them to tear you to pieces. Protect yourself so that you don't get destroyed. What Jesus is calling us to do here is just recognize our limits and embrace boundaries in our relationships with the dangerous people in our lives and exercise discernment. It's essential in this world. It's especially essential in our closest relationships and our, our most entangled relationships because that's where we find ourselves getting torn up. That's where we find ourselves getting taken advantage of. Uh, you know, and, and the problem for most of us is we keep telling ourselves, well, I can fix this person if I just keep working on this. But you know what? The Bible says you're not the Savior. They need the Savior. The, we say, well, you know, I, I love this person, and my love ought to be enough to fix them. But you know what? Your love isn't enough to fix them. They need the love of Jesus in their life. Or sometimes we say, you know, I'm just so angry I want to punish this person. But that's a way of holding on as well. What God says is, do not take vengeance because it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. God says we even got to leave the consequences, leave the punishment, leave the correction ultimately to God because we can't, we can't restore all these things. You know, holding on to anger, holding on to judgment, holding on to condemnation is another way of continuing to give to these destructive people power in our lives. 
sometimes the thing that we can't let go of is our own anger or bitterness towards a person who has hurt us in this way or has taken advantage of us in this way. But the healthy thing to do, the only thing to do, is to let it go, to say, I will no longer give to this person the power, the ability to ruin my life and to, to poison my, my, my spirit. What we can do is commit them to God, because God is the judge. God is the savior. God is the redeemer. God is the one who is the source of a love that can redeem their lives if he chooses to. And he's the source of one of, he's the one who can bring redemption and restoration to our lives if we allow him to. And so sometimes the biggest act of faith that you'll take in these destructive relationships that we all find ourselves entangled in from time to time is to say, I'm not going to give anymore. I'm not going to open anymore. I'm going to let this go. I'm going to operate with boundaries, and I'm going to walk away. Because, see, the basic principle of the gospel is, you know, people don't need you. They need Jesus. You're not the savior of anybody. Jesus is the savior. You're not the redeemer of these broken situations. Jesus is the redeemer. And you're not the judge of those who've done wrong. God alone is the judge. You can't trust him for anybody else. Your job is just to trust him for yourself, for your own life, for today and tomorrow and the day after this. And to believe that his love for you is ultimately all you need. And his love for you is ultimately the thing that you need to rest on. And, and, and your hope in life is not that you can <coughs> condemn someone else and make them suffer so you feel better, but your justification comes from the fact that Jesus gave his life for you and you're justified by faith in him and in him alone. He was willing to take the blame for your sins so that you could be set free and could, and could live forever. And he's able to redeem even the brokenness of your life if you'll come to him and rest in him. That's the message that the church has for our broken world. And if we bring that message to ourselves, our lives will be changed. If we bring that message to our friends and neighbors, our families and friends will be renewed. Our city can be renewed. And ultimately and eventually our hope is our whole world will be renewed by that message and by that hope. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that there is a source of justification. There is hope for justification and redemption and restoration through our Lord Jesus Christ. Help us, we pray, to rest in him, to believe in him. Make that real to us, we pray, in his holy name. Amen.